Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to be back tonight in verses 27 to 30. And I've entitled this, this message in our series, Mission Driven. Mission Driven. So to, to be mission driven, I guess we have to first start off with what does that mean? What does it mean to be mission, a mission driven church, to be mission driven? Because we have to get this right. We, we have to get this right or, or, or we might wind up just turning into a religious social club. That's, that's the danger if we don't get this right. And so before we can really answer that question, we have to determine what our mission is as a local church. Because lots of people have thoughts on what the mission of the local church is, right? We've talked about that tonight, diversity and differences of opinions and things like that, that we all think that, you know, the church has different uh, uh, goals and whatnot, but we can't, we can't be divided on, on the mission. Some would believe that the mission of the local church is just to gather regularly and to sing and to say the Bible, right? That's the mission. That's not the mission. That's not the mission. Some believe the mission of the local church is to, to, to feed the hungry and to clothe the poor and to, and to, to meet needs in the community, right? That's not, that's not the mission either, right? Some would believe that the mission of the local church is to just to build friendships and create a safe environment to hide away from the evils in the world. That's not our mission either. I can go on and on about different ideas of what the mission, people would say the mission of the local church is. Don't confuse purpose with mission. That, that's what happens. That's when you confuse the two. Purpose and mission get confused. We only have one mission, to make disciples of all nations. That's it. That, that is the mission. That is the one mission that we have as a, as a local church, as a global church, to share the gospel with the world, to make the grace of Jesus known to every tribe nation and tongue on the planet that's our mission right now backing up a little bit and talking about the purposes that the, the difference in a, in a mission and the, pur- the purpose of the church we have five main purposes the first main, the first of our purposes and these aren't don't go in any any order it's just the way i learned it in, in seminary uh is it, is it an acronym or an acrostic where you use letters to spell out acrostic uh, every every dead frog must wiggle that's the way i, I learned it so you have evangelism, discipleship, fellowship. Don't, don't cycle through them. I'm, just <laughs> I'm reading them off. Every, every evangelism, discipleship, uh, fellowship, uh, every dead frog must, ministry, and worship. Right? So that's how I, I learned it that way. So evangelism is the first purpose. Right? Evangelism is where we reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus. That's, that's what it is in a nutshell. Everyday life encounters with people, organized visitation, uh, handing out gospel tracts, placing those in places, uh, using social media, right, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all these things. That's, that's how we can uh, do evangelism. Uh, the next one is discipleship, discipleship, all right? That's where we learn, learn and grow to be more like Jesus. We do that through Sunday school we have here, uh, through the training union hour we have that, uh, through various Bible studies and, and topical book studies. Uh, that can be done either here or in homes. You know you can do this at home, right? Everything that, that we do, we don't have to do it here all the time. We can also do it at home. Hopefully, you are doing it at home, right, Dur- during the week. It doesn't have to be just church-sanctioned Bible study. You can study the Bible on your own. This isn't the Catholic Church, right? I'm not the Pope, and I'm not the priest. That you, you have the ability to study God's Word for yourself. Also, we have in discipleship, small group mentoring. That's where it's life on life, thinking about that at uh, 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 a more mature man or woman in the faith takes on a, a, a disciple of their own, a, a younger person in the faith to mentor them and teach them. That's what we saw Jesus do. We talk about how he had 12 disciples, but we also know that he really invested deeply in three of them. Peter, James, and John. That's the one we always hear about. It's always Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and it says the other guys, the other disciples. If we had to really search hard to find out what their names are because they're not really mentioned very often except for those three. And then fellowship, fellowship. It's basically, it's sharing of life together, right? The good times and the bad times. It's, it's simply spending time with one another, building relationships. It's investing ourselves in the lives of others. Meals together, we, we get that part, right? Baptists, we get that. We have that one down pat. Uh, uh, doing things we enjoy together, hobbies together, uh, serving together, working alongside one another Praying together, crying together, laughing together. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about fellowshipping. And, of course, ministry. Ministry is the, is the hands and feet. The, it's the working side 
of our faith, right? Ministry, meeting needs. It's that being the hands and feet of Jesus, uh, serving others with our gifts, with our talents, with our times, with our finance, uh, with our time and with our finances, right? All those things being done in the church, in the community, both locally and globally. That's what we're talking about that when we talk about ministry. And, of course, worship. Worship. That's where we recognize and, and, and praise God for who he is and what he is doing. And everything that we do is to be worshipful. Right? Everything. Let all the things that we do, let them be worshipful. And so by saying that, worship is far more than this. Guitars, pianos, hymn books, singing. Worship goes way beyond that. We can, we can sing without worshiping, amen? <laughs> we, 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 and sometimes we do it quite often that we just sing the songs without worshiping. Worship is everything. The sermon right now, taking God's word, uh, uh, ingesting it, being changed by it, that's worship. Serving is worship, right? It's all a heart attitude. So all things should be worshipful for us. So for us to get back to where we, where we started out, this idea of mission, being a mission-driven church, we're going to see three traits from our passage tonight. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, where we'll start. A mission-driven church is a sensitive church. It's a sensitive church. It says, in, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Right? A mission-driven church is sensitive to what's going on in the world around them, which means that we're not self-focused. It means that we don't live in, in isolation from the rest of society. We have talked about it earlier in, the, in our discipleship time that we can't, we can't know what's going on if we're not connected, right? We can't, we can't know what's happening in people's lives and if we never know what's happening in the outside world if we stay, stay cocooned off. In our text uh, tonight, uh, God sent prophets to Antioch uh, to, to warn of a coming great famine. A word had come. And we talked about in the past that prophets, biblical prophets in the Old Testament, were a little different than the ones in the New Testament, but they were quite similar. Uh, prophets were typically uh, forth uh, tellers, not future, you know, uh, fortune tellers. They would they would tell, "Thus saith the Lord," they would speak for the Lord. But in, in this case, it's a little different. Uh, Agabus was the one who was sent, and we'll remember Agabus because he'll show up again in, in chapter twenty-one. He's going to be the guy who come to Paul and said and wraps his hand up and said, "This is what's going to happen to the one who this belt belongs to." talking about how Paul was going to be arrested. So he's going to show up again later. He shows up and, 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 and prophesies about this great famine. And what God was doing here by sending these prophets, it was letting this church in Antioch know what was coming so they would have the opportunity to serve and to be part of a blessing, to be part of a, a relief effort for the, for the coming famine. Now, Think about it this way. If you, you, you get your, your Bible out and you look at your maps and you see where Jerusalem's at and Judea and all that area, uh, Samar uh, Antioch is not that far. So, so surely th this famine is probably going to affect them as well. Because sometimes that's what goes through our minds whenever we, we're, we're, sometimes we're more apt to help when we, with our excess, right? If, if times for us aren't really tight, if, if we have excess, we're, we're more willing to, to, to be generous when we have excess. But when things are tight, whenever money's tight, whenever, you know, we're kind of looking out for ourselves a lot of times if we're, if we're honest. And so uh, this church in Antioch, when the, the prophets come and warned of these things, they, they laid aside their needs and say, we understand a great famine is coming. God has sent a messenger, a, a, a messenger with this, this warning. And so he wants us to participate. He wants us to join in this relief effort. So a mission-driven church is sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's what we see here, that, that this prophet was working, uh, the Spirit was working through this prophet, uh, the prophets, and Agabus was the main one. So regardless of what may seem rational or irrational, always do what the Spirit of God is leading you to do. Right? Because I, I tell you what, a lot, a lot of times God will lead you to do some things that will take you out of your comfort zone. Amen? He, he wants you to do that. that. That sometimes things seem a little crazy that, you know, you're like, I'm, all right, Lord, I, I feel you leading me to do this, but this don't make any sense. You want me to leave this job to go to this job. You want me to leave this, my family here and move away to, to that place where I don't know anybody. You want me to, 
to, to uproot everything and start over again, right? The Spirit's leading, do it. When the, the Spirit says to, uh, to, to give away what you have when you have little to give, give it in faith, right? Let go. When the Spirit says to, to, to go somewhere when, that, that you have no way to go, just start walking, right? Just start walking. I, I, I think of uh, 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 Abram, right? He wasn't Abraham yet, so he was just Abram whenever God called him uh, to leave uh, and, and to go to an unnamed land where he just started walking. He, just, he, he got his stuff, got his servants and packed up and just started moving until God would show him where he would go. So the only way that we can be sensitive to the Spirit's leading is by submitting ourselves fully to his leadership in our lives. Right? We've got to submit ourselves. We pray for his wisdom and his direction. Uh, just a few examples that in Scripture that we know of when you think about these things. Uh, remember when Ananias was sent to minister to Saul after his conversion. Right? That, that scared Ananias to death. He's like, you want, you, you know, the, the, the angel appeared or, or the, the Spirit of God appeared working together, however you want to look at that, and said, you need to go and, and, and minister to, to Saul. And, and Ananias was like, Saul of Tarsus, the, the, the persecutor of the church, that, you want me to go to him? You want me to, 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 to go to that guy? And, and the Spirit is like, exactly. That's exactly who I want you to go to. Right? So he had to be sensitive to the Spirit, and he had to surrender to the Spirit. And also, just a few weeks ago, we, we, we read where, where Peter uh, was sensitive and, and obedient to the Spirit's leading as he went to, to visit Cornelius, right? The, the centurion, a Gentile, totally against the grain of, of his upbringing of, of Judaism, is totally opposite of what he, he, know, he knew to do. And of course, later on in, in Scripture, uh, later on in Acts, as, as a matter of fact, we see where Paul was direct, redirected by the Holy Spirit. Remember, he wanted to go on uh, 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 to, to Asia, but he was redirected to Macedonia, right? That's the, known as the Macedonian call that he, he planned to go to Asia, but the Spirit of God said, no, not going to happen. It's not, not yet time. I got work for you to do over here. So all these things are, are examples of, of surrendering to listen to the Spirit of God and do what the Spirit of God uh, tells us to do. So we pray. We pray for wisdom and direction. And we also, we study. We study. We study the scriptures to make sure what, what you feel you're being led to do lines up with the character of God. Right? Because God's not going to tell you to do something that contradicts his word. I believe that was a, one of the, the lines in our Sunday school lesson this morning is that the Holy Spirit uh, is never going to lead you to do something that contradicts God's word. So nobody is ever going to make me believe they're going to come to me and say, Brother Mike, uh, this, the, I've, I've been praying and, and I really feel that God's telling me I need to divorce my wife. Not going to happen. God, the Spirit of God's not telling you that. It might be some other spirit, but it's not the Spirit of God. He's, that's not going to be that's not going to be an answered prayer from from the Lord. Does that make sense? He's never going to do that. To have you, you know, I, I've been I've been praying and, and uh, the Lord's been leading me that I need to take a gun and go shoot up the abortion clinic. He's been leading me to do that. Not not God. That that, that the Lord's not going to lead you to do that, right? That that that's not going to be something that that He's going to lead you to do that. The, contradict his character in the bible so be careful we also see that a mission-driven church is sensitive to the other's needs sensitive to others needs the philippian uh, church stands out in scripture as one of the as a, as a great example of a mission-minded church and paul would often commend them about their generosity and their partnership with him in the ministry of the gospel a sure sign that a church is not mission-minded is when they turn inward focused Right? That's, a, that's a red flag, that, that everything you read, anything about a, a failing church, a dying church, a church on decline, one of the major things you always see is they just turn inward focused. Everything, everything is regulated. Everything is just, just about the membership, and that's it. Everything is geared towards keeping members happy and comfortable. Right? Happy and comfortable. Uh, little or no interest in reaching the community with the gospel. Little or no interest in ministering to those outside of the church family. And little or no expectations of visitors. Right? That, that's a real telltale sign. When you don't expect to have visitors, right, nothing, nothing in place, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. We must keep our eyes and ears open to opportunities that God places before us on a daily basis. Going back to it again. This, this means that we must interact with other people. We must interact with other people. This means we don't discriminate against anyone. 
Right? We don't get to pick and choose who we'll serve and who we won't serve. Right? We, don't, we have no criteria that way. Well, I don't like those people. I, I don't like what they believe. I don't, we disagree, so guess what? I'm not going to serve them. It don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't get to pick and choose. God places people in our, in our path, and we serve them. All the Antioch church knew about this, this great famine was that it was coming, and they needed to help. They need to give the relief the best they could. That's a church that's driven by its mission. To display the gospel in in, in tangible ways and selflessness. That's what mission driven looks like. We serve because that's what Jesus has done for us. I think of some some great examples of of ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention. You think of the, uh, the, the disaster relief teams. You know what I'm talking about? Those guys with those yellow hats. You see those, those, those mobile kitchens on the road. You see uh, chainsaw crews. You see right now uh, off in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and up in northern Louisiana uh, that teams are sent out to, 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 to dig mud. They're demudding teams. That Their sole purpose is to go there and, and get the mud out of the house, remove sheetrock and all those type of things. That's what I'm talking about whenever you see uh, uh, serving in a selfless way. Uh, also... Another example that uh, Leslie and I have had the privilege and, and Caleb uh, of serving in and something that uh, I'm, I'm seriously considering getting us reconnected with uh, next year is a, a, a mission team. It's called Builders for Christ. And maybe you've heard something similar. And what it is is where uh, it's, a, it's a, a group of men, women, and children that every year, the first week of June, the first full week of June, June uh, they've already, uh, the groundwork's been laid. They've uh, assessed a, a potential church to assist and what it is the church will uh, has a need either fellowship hall uh, adding on to a sanctuary a new building and, and in one case we went and, and and rebuilt a church that was blown away by a tornado and so what it is is that that the, that we will volunteer a week a week or two of our time our skills right and, and our talent and we will go there and and work they provide the, the materials and we provide the, provide the labor right you take your vacation time Right? You take your time off of work, you take all those things, and, you, and selflessly you give that time to that opportunity. Right? That's what we're talking about. A mission-driven church is a sensitive church. That's the bottom line. Also, a mission-driven church is a generous church. A generous church. Verse 29 says, Then the disciples each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Of course, a, a generous church it has to be made up of generous people. And generosity is a big clue when you're looking at uh, whether or not a person has, a, 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 has been redeemed. A truly redeemed heart is a generous heart. Greed and selfishness is the exact opposite of being like Jesus. Right? It's the exact opposite. How tightly we hold on to our money and possessions speaks volumes about the conditions of our heart. Right? That's, that's the cold, hard truth. Paul bragged on the generosity of the Macedonians to the Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, uh, 1 to 5. It says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in, in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberty their liberality for i bear witness that according to their ability yes and beyond their ability they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints and not only as we had hoped but they first gave themselves to the lord and then to us by the will of god notice the order of things in verse five so they gave themselves to the lord first indicating they were saved which led them to give themselves away in acts of incredible generosity even amidst their own poverty right. you want you want to know an example you want some fruit of being saved that's fruit of being saved a generous church is made up of generous individuals now i hadn't talked much about money since i've been here and i don't like to talk about uh, money too much from the pulpit i just i just don't but sometimes when you come to a text like this, it's a, this is a good teaching time, a good teachable moment. Because when you talk about money, it tends to have a, a few different effects to people. 
it makes those that give like they should prideful and resentful of those who don't, right? You say, well, I give and I write and, you know, I, I do this and I do that. So you get prideful, right? Then you have the others uh, it, that brings a sense of shame and guilt to those that don't give or give very little. And then you have a, another group that those that have no plan on ever giving anything and still won't give no matter what I say or teach from the Scripture. That's just, that's just the reality of things. So if you don't give out of a sense of obligation, if you give out of a sense of obligation, pride, guilt, or manipulation, you're giving for the wrong reasons. Right? That, that's the truth. If, you, if you're giving because I've shamed you, I've guilted you, I've manipulated you, if that's what the reason that you give money to the church, it's for the wrong reasons. We simply give as a response to what God has given to us. Right? That, that's, that's, that's what we do. It's an act of worship is what it is. It's how, God has resor- it's how God resources the church from ministering to the world. Right? I mean, that, that's just the facts, that, that, that we, we, are, we are only limited by our willingness to give and what we can do, right? The things that we're able to do, to resource and to fund. It's simple mathematics. The more money we have at our disposal, the more we can give away to support the ministry of the gospel. And you heard me right, the more we can give away the more we can give away. Missions, right? Support missions, missionaries, uh, a cooperative program, all those things, uh, 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 love offerings, people in need in the community, giving it away. Our giving does way more than pay my salary and keep the lights on. That's what some people think. That's why some people don't want to give. They say all, all, all that money does is pay the, the preacher's salary and keep the lights on. I just, I just soon give to, give to charity. I'll, I'll take care of the money myself. That's great. Give to charity. But, but, but before that, the Lord says to take care of the church, right, to, to, take, to, to bring to the storehouse. And so just, just quickly, we're going to look at a few things. It's the basics of giving in the church, right? Tithing. What do we know about tithing? We use that word a lot. Tithing is an Old Testament requirement, right? You, you read the Old Testament, it's a, it's a 10% of everything, money, animals, harvest, first fruits, those type of things. That's what we know of. Uh, that was an Old Testament uh, thing. And then you, you roll over into the New Testament, the, the, the idea of giving in the New Testament. If you're, if you're, you're reading through the text, you, you're going to find that there's really no specific amount given. Right? If, you're, if you're honest, if you search, if you, you want to really know the truth about it, no specific amount is specified. Uh, Acts 11.29 says that we should give according to our ability. According to our ability. And then 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 7 and 8 says this. It says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. We truly cannot outgive God. You, you, can't, you can't outgive God. When we are generous, God says that we will have an abundance for every good work. You say, well, if I give everything away, then how am I going to live? That ain't going to happen. Try it. <laughs> Try it. God, God has assured us that we'll have what we need. So generosity, our giving, all boils down to one thing, one question. Do you trust God to provide? Do you trust God to provide? That, that's what it all comes down to. We don't give so God will bless us. Right? That's a mistake. That's, that's one of the things of prosperity gospel. They'll like to do that. You sow a seed of faith. If you, if you give this much money, God's going to multiply it back to you, right? If that's your motive, you might as well keep your money, right? That, that's, not, that's not how God works. It's not some uh, get-rich uh, plan. We don't give so God will, will multiply it back to us. We don't give to make up for our sinful week. You can't, you can't pay for your sins with your money, Right? That's, that's, that's some, it's like blood money. You know, I, I, maybe I've been out of church for a while and I come back and I feel indebted. I feel the, the guilt of my sin or whatever it is. And so I'm going to write a bigger check. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to atone for my sins with a big check. That don't work either. That don't work either. Keep your money. We give because our God is a giver. We give because our God is a blesser. It's a family trait. It's a family trait. A, a generous heart, a giving heart is a trait of our Father, our Heavenly Father. The Antioch Christians were trusting God to provide for them as they were providing for the other churches. A mission-driven church is a generous church. 
the generous church. And our last thing that we see in our, our passage tonight is that a mission-driven church is a responsible church. A responsible church. Look at verse 30. It says, This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Right. This offering that they collected, they took special care in handling the money that was given. They used a two-man rule. Anybody familiar with a two-man rule? Right. It's about accountability and safety. Right. The two-man rule protects both the ones giving and the ones responsible for the care of the money. Nobody should be handling church money by themselves. Nobody. And you say, what, you don't trust me? I, I trust you. It's not, a, it's not about trusting you. It's about protecting you. It's about protecting the church. Right? You, you say, you know, uh, 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 no, nobody, nobody in the church would ever steal from the church, right? You must not watch the news or read the newspaper very often, right? You know, people are, are here. You know, people are still sinners. And, and when you have the temptation before you, and when, who knows what you're capable of? Any of us are capable of. We'd say that I would never do that, but never say never. So this removes that temptation. If we have two people there, at least two people, it's, it's a good way to, to handle that. It's a good policy to have. First and foremost, it's about accountability. And so don't, don't think that nobody's accusing anybody of being a thief. That's not the point. That's not what we're talking about here. It does, however, remove the temp temptation to steal. It happens all the time. Or sometimes something finally happens and a church finds out that someone has been stealing from their, their weekly offering for years because there was no accountability in place. No safeguards, no redundancy in counting, right? Just be wise. That's what we see here. That's why it doesn't just say Saul took the money. It doesn't just say Barnabas took the money. He didn't just stick the money in his bag and head off down the road. No, they wanted to be above reproach. They didn't, they, any, any possible suspicion of anything going wrong or, or, or being underhanded, they wanted to do away, do away with it. It's also about being, uh, uh, having good stewardship, right? Good stewardship. You know, I would ask the question, why do you use the bank that you use? If you, does everybody in here use a bank or, or some people like, you know, like don't trust banks? They'd rather just hold on their money themselves and got your walls full of money and got it, you know, buried in the yard and stuff like that. No? No? Okay. Me neither. I, I, I use a bank basically just to, to be able to process my money. I don't have a savings. I'm just letting you know that. It, it's basically it goes in there so I can process it to wherever it needs to be sent out to. But why do, why do we choose the banks that we choose? It's probably because they have a, 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 a reputation for protecting money, right? They're taking care of the money. You know, would you feel comfortable putting your money in a bank that was known for being broken into all the time or, or one that was always having a problem with money mysteriously disappearing? Would you feel comfortable being doing that? Would that be the bank you would want to use? No, I, I, I'm sure you wouldn't. So for us as a, as a body of believers, as a local church, when people uh, give to the church, they should know that their money is secure and will be used for the purpose that it was given for, right? It's a peace of mind. When people, when people trust the church, when people know uh, that the money will be cared for and used for the right things, they're, they're more likely to give it, right? That's what we're talking about here, being, being good stewards. They should know that we have policies and procedures in place to safeguard against theft and fraud. Antioch used uh, possibly two of their best and most respected men to be responsible for transporting the offering from Antioch to Jerusalem, Barnabas and Saul, right? They could have sent anybody. They could, they could have just picked a couple of guys out of, out of the church, somebody that wasn't, you know, doing this or that, but they chose probably their two best men, most respected men, to be responsible for, for carrying this offering to Jerusalem. And so for us tonight, as we close our time together, I want us to think through a couple of things. Because the church in Antioch was mission-driven, means they had a, a kingdom view of the church, uh, they were willing to be a huge blessing to their sister churches. And so what about us? Right? You know, do, do, we, do we sometimes feel like we're in this alone and we're just about self-preservation, or do we have a, a bigger view on the church? Not just, uh, we're not in this alone, but we unite and I would say that we do to an extent. We, 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 we participate in a cooperative program uh, in, in, in the state, associ you know, local association, the state uh, convention, and also the convention. So we're, we're doing that part 
uh, uh, for sure on one, on one front. But if we're going to be a, a church that blesses others, we're going to have to be a mission-driven church. That, that's, that's all it can be. It has to boil down to that. We have to be a mission-driven church. We have to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading and opportunities that arise, both local and global. Right? We have to be connected. We have to, to open our eyes to the realities of the things around us, that we don't just turn a blind eye to what's happening. Right? If there's a need that in the community, a need in our family, or something that we can, we can minister to and reach out to, we need to jump on that. Right, we need to jump on that. It's our responsibility. It's not somebody's other, somebody else's responsibility. We don't pass the buck. That's what I'm saying. We don't, we don't, well, somebody else can do it. If we can do it, we need to do it. If we know about it, we need to take care of it. We also have to be generous, to be givers instead of takers. We also have to be responsible. We're accountable, right? Be accountable and be good stewards. So let's commit ourselves to being a mission-driven church tonight. Let's pray, and we'll have a few moments to respond. God, we thank you so much for your word. There's so much in these, these few verses here tonight, God. And sometimes we, over, we get confused about what we're here for. We get confused about uh, our mission. Uh, we, we confuse uh, mission with purpose and so father forgive us where we get off track we thank you for your grace thank you for uh, using us uh, to accomplish uh, your will to to be your hands to be your feet that you've allowed us to be uh, used by you to deliver the greatest message to mankind the gospel so father i pray that we're a, a, a gospel sharing people that we're a, we're a, a, a needs meeting people Father, we're generous. Father, we're sensitive to the needs around us, God. And, and where these things aren't happening in our lives right now, we thank you for the grace that you'll give us to, uh, to get on track, that tonight we can com commit ourselves. Father, we're, we're not doing these things. Tonight we would ask for forgiveness, that we would repent. And, Father, from this day forward, we would commit to be a mission-driven church. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.